Well, brothers and sisters, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to uh, be with you today and look forward in a short while to hearing from Elder and Sister Rasband. Um, I, I do want to say just a couple of things. This won't make any difference to any of you, but, but I've got to just say I'm an assistant director in the, in the priesthood and family department. That won't matter to anybody except for the person who is the executive director. <laughs> Um, the second thing I wanted to say is, as mentioned, we had the opportunity uh, a few years ago, my wife and I, to, to live in Italy where I presided over one of the missions. And the best, we were living in, in what we say in English, Padua, or in Italian they say at Padova, which is a, a city uh, close to Venice. Um, and the best option for our our sons, the, the real privilege and opportunity that they had for their high school years was to attend a Dodd school on the Vicenza Army Post. And uh, so we had the, the delightful experience of having privileges to go on base. They wouldn't allow us in the commissary, but we could go on base and attend things at the high school and uh, be part of, in a sense, that military community. And we it was actually a, a delightful and important experience for our, for our sons to have that opportunity, and we, we appreciated that. One, one other thing that I wanted to say just by way of introduction is uh, I am very much aware of the fact that we have in this great group today, of course, many military chaplains, but we also have chaplains at hospitals and schools and other facilities. Um, now, it would be easy in a conference like this to start feeling bad because, well, they're talking so much about the military or they're talking a lot about this other thing. What, what I have loved is this spirit that we have here of uh, recognizing what brings us together more than what divides us and uh, grateful for the good that you do in blessing people's lives wherever you happen to be. Now. Um, shortly before uh, Jesus was crucified, there, there's a really interesting experience that, that he had with his apostles. You know, you, you'll remember that he had been telling them about uh, some of the changes that were going to happen with the temple being destroyed and some other things happening. And they then went and sat on the Mount of Olives. And the apostles said to him, tell us what the signs are of, of your second coming. What are going to be the signs before the end of the world? And what followed is what we have in, recorded in Matthew chapter 24, where Christ talks about the last days and what were going to happen in the last days, what the signs of the last days were going to be. Now, as you know, Joseph Smith did a, what he called a new translation, uh, sometimes called the inf inspired version of the Bible, and we have that. But there are a couple of different parts of it that have been deemed to be important enough that we have made them part of the uh, standard works of the church. And, and one of those is his version of Matthew chapter 24. It's in the Pearl of Great Price is Joseph Smith, Matthew. And as you look at Joseph Smith, Matthew, and, at, uh, and as some other scriptures, I, I would suggest to you section 45 of the Doctrine of Covenants, what you see is a, is a series of the signs leading up to, to Christ's second coming on the earth. Now, I want to read you some of them and see if any of these sound familiar to you. Um, the, the fullness of the gospel would come. That the gospel would be preached in all the world. And that there'd be a gathering of the elect from the four quarters of the earth. Now I'm pausing just because that's the end of the positive list. But, but I want you to catch those, that, that, that those wonderful things would happen. We'd have the fullness of the gospel, the gospel would be preached in all the earth, and that there'd be an, 
a gathering of the elect. Now, see if any of the rest of these sound familiar. Wars and rumors of war. That people would take up weapons against each other and kill each other. Now that one is a, hits a little close to home right now. That there'd be famines, pestilences, earthquakes, iniquity shall abound, the love of men would wax cold, and then there's, uh, there are three that have to do with signs in the heaven that there would be, um, that the whole earth would be in commotion, and that men's hearts would fail them. In fact, there are three of them that have to do with men's hearts, that men's hearts would fail them, and we could, just, we could have an interesting discussion on what that means, that people would turn their hearts from God because of the precepts of men, that men would harden their hearts against God. Now, all of those that I've mentioned are there. I think we can look at them and, and, uh, and say, yeah, I guess we're moving toward the second coming because those all sound familiar. And frankly, some of them have particularly to do with what you do um, as chaplains. But I haven't mentioned the very first one that is, that is included in Joseph Smith Matthew, and it's the one that is mentioned the most. And yet, I think sometimes we fail to even note it as we talk about the signs of the second coming. You know what it is? People being deceived. Take a look at, with me, or listen if you, if you wish, to, uh, to what the Savior says. The first thing he said after, the, after his apostles said, tell us the signs of, the second, of thy coming, he said, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And many false prophets shall arrive, arise and deceive many. And, uh, and then, verse 22, For in those days there shall also arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if possible, they shall deceive the very elect, and that this is a phrase that Joseph Smith added, who are the elect according to the covenant. So what does it mean that the very elect according to the covenant are going to be some of those who get deceived? I think it probably means that there are some people who have entered into covenants with the Lord, like baptism, or like the oath and covenant of the priesthood, or like the covenants in the temple, that among those who are going to be deceived, this very elect, we're going to be some members of the church. And so one of the key things for us is to try to figure out how is it that we don't get deceived. Now, by the way, when it talks about that there'd be false prophets and false Christs, in my mind, I'd always pictured that that would be people standing in street, on street corners, maybe with signs, yelling, repent. But that's not where the false prophets are. Where are they? They're on the internet and other places, giving false information to deceive even the very elect according to the covenant. Now, this is sounding like a really negative talk, isn't it? Let me turn to a more positive aspect of it. Thankfully, in Joseph Smith Matthew and in section 45, there are some keys to how we in our time can avoid being deceived. And I want to, I'll list the four of them that I want to talk about, two from Joseph Smith Matthew and two from section 45, and then as time permits, we'll, we'll visit with you about them. The first one comes from verse 11. This is what it says. But he that remaineth steadfast and is not overcome, the same shall be saved. So the first point as to how you avoid being deceived is you stay steadfast. I'll come back to that in a minute. 
The second one comes from verse 37. It says this, And whoso treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. I take great comfort in that, by the way, that, that if we will treasure up God's word, or this is Jesus Christ speaking, if we will treasure up the, the words of Jesus Christ, we won't be deceived. The, the next two come from section 45. And first in verse 32, but my disciples shall stand in holy places and shall not be moved. In other words, one of the ways that you don't get moved off of the truth is to find yourself standing in holy places. And then the last one I want to mention, again, from section 45. Now, just to set this up a little bit, um, the Lord in section 45 retells the parable of, of the ten virgins, that there were five that were wise and there were five that were foolish and the, and the five that were wise had oil in their lamps. Th that's a wonderful teaching from the Savior, a wonderful, but, but he gives us additional insight about that parable in what he has to say in section 45. He says this, for they that are wise, that is the wise virgins that had oil in their lamp, and have received the truth, and have taken the Holy Spirit to be their guide, and have not been deceived, verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. In other words, my, my fourth point is that you take the Holy Spirit to be your guide. Now, I want to go back and talk about each of those a little bit. First of all, remaining steadfast. Um, very early on in the Book of Mormon, we're introduced to Lehi and his family. And the way we're introduced to Lemuel is very interesting. Um, you'll remember that Lehi took his family, they went out into the wilderness, and, and they uh, came across a river. And they named the ri Lehi named the, the river Laman because he hoped that Laman would be like that river, um, in, in, in his words, running continually into the fountain of all righteousness. And then he named the valley where they were Lemuel. And, and he said to Lemuel, Oh, that thou mightest be like unto this valley, firm and steadfast and immovable in keeping the commandments of the Lord. It was... Lehi's desire that his son Lemuel would be steadfast, that he would be able to hang in there when things get difficult. Um, now, unfortunately, as the story goes on, Lemuel shows himself not to be steadfast. In fact, he would do things that were right, like go with his brothers to try to retrieve the plates or, or, or go uh, to, to get get Ishmael and his family to come join. But when things got difficult, Lemuel showed himself to be anything but steadfast. He liked to murmur. And he would join Laman in complaining and ultimately join Laman in trying to get to harm and eventually kill Nephi. And ultimately, when they arrived in the new land, in the promised land, um, Nephi had to take his family and leave because of the animosity that there was from Laman and Lemuel. So there's an example in the Book of Mormon of somebody who was not steadfast. There's another example, and, and this is from a chapter that uh, Elder Wood referenced yesterday. Uh, and and the, the scene is that Alma is, is, has been taught, is, is speaking to his sons. And he talks to Helaman, and then he talks to Shiblon. And one, this is one of, part of what he says about Shiblon. And now, my son, I trust that I shall have great joy in you because of your steadiness and your faithfulness unto God. For as you have commenced in your youth to look to the Lord your God, even so, I hope that you will continue in keeping his commandments for blessed is he that endureth to the end. So I, I 
We got Lemuel on the one hand, who was anything but steadfast or steady. And you've got Shiblon, who is being raised up as an example here by his father to say he was steady. He could be counted on to continue in the course that he was, that he was going. Now, th this is a little dangerous with all the military people in the room for me to use an example from military history, but why not? In the book of Judges, we've got this really interesting story where, where Gideon has an army of 32,000 men to go against the Midianites. And the Midianites, they not only had 32,000 men, but the, the record says they were like grasshoppers. There were so many, or, or like the sands of the sea. And, and you've got to love the Lord's sense of humor. He says, no, that's 32,000 is too many. So tell anybody that doesn't want to fight that they can go home. And sure enough, 22,000 of them said, I'm taking leave. <laughs> you know, they left. So now he's got 10,000. And, and I suspect at this point that uh, uh, Gideon's thinking, well, I, I kind of like 32 better than 10, but so we go. And the Lord says, no, this is still too many. And you'll remember he devised a particular way to, to winnow down, and he was left with 300. 300 men to fight against an army that, that uh, is like grasshoppers or the sand of the seashore. Um, well, they had a plan. They, they carried out the plan. It, it involved uh, having, uh, uh, at a certain point, they would, they would uh, uh, do some things, including yelling the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And it, it uh, there is a really, and, and that doing that caused uh, such confusion among the Midianites that they turned on each other and started fighting each other and, and actually wiped each other out. It was one instance of the evil destroying the evil. But there's a line from, from that account that I think is highly significant. These 300 men were, were, were stationed in, positioned in such a way that they were around the Midianites. And in verse 21 of chapter 7 of Judges says this, And they stood every man in his place round about the camp. And all the host ran and cried and fled. They all stood in their place. They were steadfast in being where they were supposed to be, doing what they were supposed to do. Um, let me move to the second point. That whoso, whoso treasureth up my word shall not be deceived. Now, I love the fact that it doesn't just say those who read their scriptures won't be deceived. And in it, and it doesn't say those who memorize scriptures or listen to them on, in audio won't be deceived. It says those who treasure up my word shall not be deceived. You think about what you do with something that you treasure. You, you think about it. You, you put it in an important place. Now, the way we treasure up scriptures is not to take the book and put it in a safe. It's to put it in our hearts and put it in our minds. It, it's to rejoice in being able to, to have it and to read it. And I love the fact that you're saying it, it says treasure up, that, that it's a process that you continue to do. Um, of course, we had the wonderful experience six months ago of hearing the last talk that we have heard, at least to this point, from President Monson, and what was his subject? It was on reading the Book of Mormon. Six paragraphs, three minutes. He didn't have the kind of strength where he could give a talk as long as, as what he used to be able to do. And so, with those three minutes, with those six paragraphs, one of which dealt with announcing temples, so with five paragraphs, what did he do? Um, he, 
I want to read you part of what he said. After saying, this will sound a lot like the first part of my talk, we live in a time of great trouble and wickedness. What will protect us from the sin and evil so prevalent in the world today? I maintain that a strong testimony of our Savior Jesus Christ and his gospel will help see us through to safety. If you are not reading the Book of Mormon each day, please do so. I love the tender, kind, pleading tone in please do so. And then a promise. If you will read it prayerfully and with a sincere desire to know the truth, the Holy Ghost will manifest its truth to you. And then he goes on and makes a series of other promises with respect to the very simple thing of reading the Book of Mormon, treasuring up the words of the Lord every day. And then he ends it with this paragraph. My dear associates in the work of the Lord, Again, the tenderness of a prophet of God giving perhaps his last public talk. I implore each of you, each of us, to prayerfully study and ponder the Book of Mormon each day. As we do so, we will be in a position to hear the voice of the Spirit, to resist temptation, to overcome doubt and fear, and to receive heaven's help in our lives. I so testify with all my heart in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And then he was done. I... Uh, one of the ways that we don't get deceived in these latter days is that we treasure up the words of God. Now, I, I gave a talk a year ago in a general conference about the Book of Mormon. By the way, the title of my talk was, There is Power in the Book, taken from a quote from President Benson. This may be one of the few times that the president of the church has ever felt like he had to redo something that a 70 had done six months earlier <laughs> to try to correct my feeble efforts. But as a result of giving that talk, I have gotten letters and emails, people sharing me their stories about what has happened in their lives because of the Book of Mormon. Uh, miraculous things, powerful things. One of my favorites came from an old high school friend of mine that I hadn't seen since our high school days. He caught me up a little bit on his life. He, after we'd graduated from high school, he went on a mission, I went on a mission. Um, he got home, he fell in love, but there was a problem. The person he fell in love with was not a member of the church. And so he set about to try to convert her, and he was getting nowhere. So he came up with a plan. One of his good friends was the grandson of, of the man that was president of the church at the time. One of his good friends was the grandson of President Kimball. And so they concocted a scheme where he and his friend would both take their girlfriends and say they were going downtown Salt Lake to do something. And as they were driving, they said, do you mind if we stop by and see Bill's grandfather? Without telling him who Bill's grandfather was. So they stopped at President Kimball's apartment, knocked on the door, and President Kimball himself opened the door. Well, she wasn't a member of the church, but she did recognize the president of the Mormon church. They went in, they talked, and at a certain point, my friend's idea was to get the president of the church to say something that would instantly convert his girlfriend. <laughs> and sure enough, it came up that she wasn't a member of the church, and President Kimball said, well, you ought to do what I did. Read the Book of Mormon and pray about it. My friend was very disappointed. He wanted a zapping. He wanted a miracle to happen. But what President Kimball said is, read the Book of Mormon. And she did. And she got a testimony. And they got married. They've raised a family. They've served, I think, three missions so far now that they're retired. Um, there is power in that book. And there is something that can keep us 
from getting deceived if we daily will put that into our lives. Third point that I mentioned was to stand in holy places and not be moved. We are so blessed that, that as we venture forth on this earth, there are holy places we can stand, pieces of heaven, if you will. Now, if this were a discussion and I, I said, well, what holy places can you think of? Obviously, temples are one of the, are one of the first that comes to mind. There's just something that happens in finding yourself regularly in the holy temple. Um, there's something that, you know, I, I, I have, uh, if I were a bishop to, again today, or if I were a stake president, I would, whatever the problem I was trying to solve, I'd get people to go to the temple. There, in that rarefied air, there is just something that happens to the spirit. Participating in those ordinances has a powerful spiritual effect. Now, another place that people might mention would be our, our meeting houses or wherever the saints meet. That's one of the holy places, particularly if it's in an opportunity where we get to partake of the sacrament, sing the hymns, have prayers and lessons and talks. Uh, the Bible dictionary tells us that that second only to the temple in terms of holiness is the home. One of the things we want to do is have our homes be the kind of places where that it's a holy place. I, I had the opportunity yesterday to set apart a couple of you as in connection with your assignment being chaplains. One of the strong promptings that came to me that I said in the blessing was encouragement to have the homes be and blessing those individuals to have their homes be places of holiness, holiness to the Lord. Um, by the way, I was having this discussion with a group of stake presidents once, and I said, what are some of the holy places? And one of the stake presidents said, my shoes. <laughs> Wherever my shoes are, that's a holy place. Well, that's true. We ought to live in such a way that wherever we are, our shoes or our boots, are a holy place. Now, you gotta be careful where you let those shoes or boots go, however, because if, you're, if you let them carry you into an unholy place, you compromise that opportunity. Let me just say this about the very last one, and that's that you, taking the Holy Spirit as our guide. We heard a wonderful message this morning about Sister Harris, and, from Sister Harris, and I have done what she did in terms of just getting a rubber raft and going in a river and uh, it kind of depends on the river and on the rapids you're going to face. I also had the opportunity um, a few years ago um, to go through the Grand Canyon on the Colorado River. Don't do that without a guide. We had a guide, and I remember, and, and one of the challenges in the Colorado River, be, at least uh, through the Grand Canyon, is it depends on how much water they're releasing from the dam the rapids change all the time. And so it's gonna be different one week than it is the next. We came to one particularly precarious rapids. There was on the other side of the river, a boat that didn't have very good success through that rapids, it's kind of as a sober reminder that this is a dangerous thing. We stopped, the guide climbed a little, a little hill and looked out over, over this rapid and he thought for a minute, and he said, got it. I know how we can do this. We got down, got back into the boat, and we, as we came to the rapid, he turned it around backwards. And we went backwards down through the rapid, and then halfway through, he spun to do the second half going forward. That was the technique he could do that would keep us from overturning, going through a particularly difficult rapid on that particular day. I was so glad to have a guide now, the best uh, guide we can get is to let the Holy Spirit be our guide, that we live in such a way that he will guide us. Brothers and sisters, as we, in our lives, remain steadfast, treasure up the words of, of eternal life, as found in the scriptures and the teachings of the apostles and prophets, as we stand in holy places and as we take the Holy Spirit for our guide, we're not going to get deceived. 
we're going to stay strong and be ready to greet the, the Savior when he comes or when we meet him on the other side. I bear my testimony of the truthfulness of this wonderful work, and I express gratitude to you for what you do to bless mankind in, in all your various assignments. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.